The series begins with a sad soldier sitting by a tree, remembering an army proverb, watch out for falling leaves in your later years. He says, I couldn't do it. Three days ago, Park was at the divisional guerrilla field feeling tired and thinking he only had three days left before his discharge. He wanted to cut himself some slack, but then he heard that a new platoon leader was coming. He hated the idea and thought that the new leader, named Kim Shin Im, would be too inflexible. Suddenly, the leader stared at him, and Park thought he had heard him. He calls him by his name, which is Park Byung Jong. The platoon leader asks him to demonstrate the obstacle. Park says he will be discharged soon, but the platoon leader insists that he still needs to do it. He starts the obstacle course and thinks he will begin to hide from tomorrow. He believes that after his military service, he will become a civilian again. He suddenly trips and falls. Everyone gets worried seeing him fall. Someone is calling him. Mr. Warrior, Mr. Warrior, open your eyes. Park has a headache. There is a goddess in front of him. She introduces herself as the goddess Parla and says that he has experienced many hardships in his life. Park laughs when he hears this, as it doesn't seem real to him. He considers it a dream and tries to wake himself up by slapping himself. The goddess becomes upset seeing this and calls him a warrior, to which he tells her to shut up. He angrily say that after only three days, he would be discharged. Why is all this happening to him? Parla thinks she can understand and tries to calm him down. However, he grabs Parla in anger and says that she would have understood if she had read the webtoon. The next part is that he will be a warrior in this world. He trained for almost nine months in his previous life, and now he has to do it again. He starts crying and says she doesn't want to let him rest. He started abusing her, which makes her angry. Park says that he has seen her true colors. Parla says he doesn't deserve the warrior title. He had to be his warrior, who had to end evil and save the world. But now, she will give him nothing and send him back to Earth. Park yells that she can't do that and she angrily throws Park to the ground. Park falls to the ground. He kneads the clay into a cake shape and celebrates his discharge. Park is lying hungry in the forest, eating whatever he can find. He starts with mushrooms but then realizes it's not something humans typically do. He wonders why there is only grass everywhere in the forest and why there are no other food sources. The monsters in the forest have avoided Park because they expected him to be a formidable opponent. Park calls out to Parla, apologizing for his behavior and asking for food. Parla forgives him and grants him some items considering his past, including a menu and a shovel. Park is overjoyed to receive them. Meanwhile, Captain Dora and Nylari are wandering through the forest and feel a presence nearby. They stumble upon a cake made by Park, which they don't understand and think is a myth. Dora asks Nilari to leave, and they start running away, but Nilari stops and turns around. Suddenly, Park appears in front of them, and they are frightened by his sudden appearance. They start running again, and when they look back, they see that Park is gone. Later, Park uses his shovel to leap in front of Dora and Nilari. Surprising them with his speed, Park believes that he is in a fantasy world and challenges himself to a fight. Dora says that she cannot allow the creature out of the forest and draws her weapons, believing Park to be a dangerous creature. Dora and Nilari are scared by Park's sudden appearance in the forest, sensing an evil aura emanating from him. Park notices their fear and stops, attempting to talk to them. He throws his shovel aside and apologizes, asking them not to attack him. Despite his plea, Dora and Nilari continue to approach him aggressively, and they end up falling into one of Park's traps. Park had noticed animal footprints in the forest and had been using his shovel to dig trenches and set traps to secure food. When Dora and Nilari jump out of the trench, but Park has set many traps, a wooden log hit Nilari and she fell to the ground. Dora is concerned about Nilari. Meanwhile, Park jumped on her. He said she knew why the Koreans lost, and she also let her guard down. As soon as he said this, he attacked Dora with a shovel. Both of them fell unconscious, and Park tied them both to a tree. Dora regained consciousness. Her head was hurting. When she found herself tied, she started thinking of ways to escape. Nalari was still unconscious. Dora woke her up. As soon as she woke up, she was disturbed and began to fear death. At that time, Park came. When he saw them conscious, he started talking to them. 
Nalari was scared to death, but Dora explains to her that if Park had to kill them, he would have killed them by now. Park tells them that he is trapped here and needs their help to get out. Nalari immediately agreed, but Dora did not. Park pulled out a packet of spicy chicken hot sauce from his pocket. He prepared that sauce to tease his friends. That one packet was still in his pocket. He poured it into Dora's mouth. Dora's face turned red from the chilies. He asked Dora again if she would cooperate now. Chief Hayana worries about Dora and Nalari not returning and prays to Goddess Parla. On the other hand, Park is sitting on Dora's back in the forest and is talking to Nalari. He scares Nilari with chicken sauce. Nalari, fearing Park, agrees to help him. Nilari says she will allow him to get out of the forest. Park thinks and asks her to take her to their town. In town, Chief Hayana is with the rest. They are all worried for Nalari and Dora. A girl comes and says that both of them are back. As everyone goes outside, Park ties up Nilari and uses her as a hostage. Dora thinks that, now that they are in town, everyone can handle Park. Everyone in town gathers around Park with weapons. Park suddenly takes the name of Parla. Everyone is surprised to hear Parlia's words. Park realizes this is Parlia's world and picks Nalari up, spins her around, and puts a packet of chicken sauce over her mouth. He suddenly throws Nalari toward the crowd. Everyone rushes to kill Park, but Park starts praying in front of Parla's statue. They stop to see him praying. Park introduces himself and says that he is the warrior sent by Parla. Everyone is shocked to hear this. Meanwhile, the chief arrives and asks everyone to back off. She explains that she received an oracle from Parla, in which Parla said she was sending a warrior. Everyone is shocked to hear this, and the chief mentions that Park could be the great darkness that Parlia spoke of. Something in the sky saw Park and said, found him. It appeared to be a small spiritual flame and said, we can finally stop Parla. Everyone gathers around him. Dora is with the chief Hayana. She resents the chief for dealing with Park. Alana asks her to calm down and tells her they can't ignore the oracle. Dora says that tomorrow they will treat Park like a warrior. Chief says she has thought of a warrior test for him as Kareem is back. Kareem is one of the few rankers of the range clan. He is considered to be the strongest in physical power. His fighting power is recognized throughout the subcontinent. Chief is thinking of a competition. Park is sitting in a tent thinking of running away. He picked up a shovel and cut the roof and was about to run. Suddenly, a bullet stops him. It sounds like she is a goddess. He throws it away with a shovel. He thought that she was Parla. He picks up the bullet. It is revealed that her name is Marley and she will help him get revenge on Parlia for sending him here. She is helping him for personal reasons. Park asks why she is like a bullet. She says she is shapeshifted into a weapon that Park is familiar with. She was turning into a powerful weapon but was betrayed by Parlia. Park thinks it's not very sensible. Suddenly, an old man enters and finds it strange that Park speaks their language. He explains that Parla has granted him the ability as a reward. The old man then asks Park to come out. Marley asks if it will be helpful. Marley says she will give him more power when they both have more trust in each other. Park puts the bullet in the neck. Parla looks from the sky. She doesn't see Park. She sends Brown to visit Park. Chief tells Park that she can't decide if he is a warrior or not. Park says he is not ready yet, but Chief says he is and gets ready to fight. When the battle is about to start, Karim immediately realizes that Park is not a true warrior. Kareem mocks him, saying that he is shameless and that, although he looks innocent, he can see the hatred in his eyes. He adds that Park may have fooled the others, but he cannot fool him. He says he will guess. He says he is from another world and has misbehaved with Parla, for which Parla has sent him here as punishment. Park thinks that he is very accurate. Park asks him for proof. Kareem says that his body has the most innovative mind in town. He tells Park to face reality. Park, with all the power Parlia has given him, attacks him. Nothing happens to Kareem. Park thinks that according to military standards, a soldier can kill an enemy alone. A private can kill two enemies, a corporal can kill three enemies, and a sergeant can kill four. Only three days have passed since he was discharged from the army as a sergeant. Both attack each other fiercely, but nothing happens to Kareem. Park tries to strike Kareem with a shovel, but it has no effect. Kareem keeps striking him until Park is about to faint. Meanwhile, Marley speaks to Park through the bullet hanging from his neck and tells him to remember the importance of trust. 
She then proceeds to explain her other abilities. Marley shows him the ability. Kareem also flinches when Park regains consciousness. Kareem's life was full of wars, but he had never seen such a terrifying glow coming from Park. Kareem also seems to be very careful. Park tells Marley that he is grateful that the two of them trusted each other. Marley says she's only helping him because if he dies, she'll also be a victim. Park only has one shot for his new skill and he shouts while thinking about his past. Park runs, and everyone is upset to see him. Park remembers his time in the army, where his comrades make fun of him. Marley asks Park what he wants. Suddenly, powers come to Park, and a gun magically appears in his hand. Kareem runs towards him, but Park shoots him. Kareem falls to the ground, and the bullet magically returns to his neck. Everyone is shocked to see Kareem dead. Park says that now they are sure he is the warrior sent by Parla. Meanwhile, Kareem's voice is shouting that he is not a warrior. He is the darkness sent into this world. Everyone takes out their weapons after hearing this. Kareem says that he should be killed. Everyone attacks Park as soon as they hear this. Brown is watching from heaven. He sees Marley and realizes that Parla cannot see Park because of Marley. He goes back and tells Parley about Marley. Parla says Marley is a feeble bug and they should focus on the mission. She claims that Marley's world will be hers soon. Meanwhile, everyone has attacked at Park. As Park begins to fight, monsters emerge from the sky. They all start fighting for Park. Dora goes ahead and kills some monsters. Park is also worried. He is surprised to see demons. He thinks of running away from there, but he remembers his unique ability, cloak. Like what he used to do in the army. He was visible to everyone and suddenly disappeared. He did the same here. When Dora thought about Park, she wondered how no one had seen him running away. Park runs away. He goes away and calls Marley, but she doesn't answer. He repeatedly calls Marley, but there is no response from Marley. Suddenly, the bullet hanging in the neck starts growing and takes shape. The flame slowly transformed into a human shape and began strangling Park while calling his name. Park realizes that her appearance indicates that her strength is returning and she confirms this. Unfortunately, she came to Park to prevent Parla's plan to unite their worlds, which she did not expect to happen so soon. Park discovers that the monsters were not summoned by Marley, but rather by Parla. Marley takes offense when Park refers to her children as monsters and tells him he is being rude. Park realizes that Parla is attempting to steal Marley's world. Marley cries that she could not protect her children and was forced to reabsorb them. Park realizes that the village that asked him to defeat the evil is made up of Marley's children. Suddenly, they realize someone is there. They saw that there was a boy. The boy tries to pass out when he sees Park. Park, in a loud voice, says that he will kill him, so he immediately wakes up. He says he is not from this village, and he is a spy. He comes from a place where people hate the Parlin faith. The boy said his name was Saint June. He explains that he is against Parlin faith. He was ordered to enter the village. He transformed himself and came to this village. He looked at Park. He saw that Park was a scary man and was afraid of him. He went to the town and started working according to his mission. Then Park's arrival in the city, the Oracle and Karim's fight. Everything was terrific and it all happened in one day. He was about to leave when he thought that Park might be able to help them. So he followed him. Park hears this and starts hitting him. Marley stops Park from killing June, despite his potential threat. Park acknowledges that June's words could be both true or false. Marley agrees with Park's suspicion, but June insists killing him would attract unwanted attention from his organization and empire, potentially endangering them all. Kareem is still alive and they will hunt them down. June believes that in their situation, they can't survive for long. June offers them his help, stating that he is a genius spy. Park likes his determination and decides to keep him. However, Park has a plan. The plan is, they are going on an adventure. Park for himself, Marley for her children, and June for his organization while tying up Jun for their adventure. The two planets collide, and goddess Parla is pleased that it was a success. She orders White to show him around and a black-jacketed man turns his head towards the voice of the goddess. It is revealed that him is Kim Shin Im, who had witnessed Park's death. Kim asks if it's a dream, but Parla informs him that this is a new world and not a dream. 
Kim keeps muttering to himself, too focused on the current situation, which causes him to ignore Parla's speech. Parla then restores Kim's memories, and he realizes that he has already passed away in his world. He believes that this is not a dream after all. Parla informs him that God has given him this chance by his mercy and that she can take him back to the time before Park's death, but with one condition. Kim agrees to it, despite the hardship it may bring, and appreciates the opportunity given to him by God. The condition set by Goddess Parla is that Kim must become a warrior and eliminate all the evils. Meanwhile, a mother and her child were walking home, chatting about the class that the kid had learned when a massive creature broke through the barrier and slammed onto the empire. The people started to flee in fear, but Kim fell from the sky, directed towards the creature. Before this, at the heaven, Parla gave Kim the power to become a worthy warrior. She told him not to be afraid of this new world as white, would be his guide. Back in the present, Kim felt immense power flowing into his body, and White transformed herself into a sword that allowed Kim to use it to land on the Empire. He told the people not to worry as the hero would protect them. Meanwhile, at the entrance of the Empire, Park and June disguised themselves as a priest and a nun. The guard checked whether they were on the wanted post, but Park and June just smiled at him. Back in the past, they discussed their adventure. Park's idea was to go straight to the Empire, and June called him crazy. Park wanted to teach him a lesson that it was better to go straight to the enemy's den if you knew you were going to be chased anyway. June agreed to cooperate with Park on the way to the Empire. Back in the present, the guard was glad that the priest had come to the Empire, and they managed to enter without difficulty. Park was surprised it was that easy to enter, and June showed off his makeup and luck skills, which allowed them to pass into the Empire easily. Park felt annoyed, but he also thought that June was a helpful person. Suddenly, a kid bumped into Park, and he acted kindly towards the kid, which surprised June as he had never seen Park being sweet before. After that, Park found a doll on the ground, and it was from the kid. Park told the kid he had dropped the doll, and as he checked on the doll, he realized that the doll's face was so familiar to the person he knew, which was Kim Shin. Im, at St. June's hideout, Park angrily stared at the doll. The people in the Empire told them that the doll was the warrior and informed them about the incident where monsters were appearing out of nowhere from the sky. The warrior and the angel saved their lives. June told Park not to worry too much. Park expected the hero to come and confess that he was originally a warrior candidate. Marley and June were surprised that his wrecked personality was a warrior. Park knew that he was not a warrior, so there must be a new guy who became a new warrior. He angrily stared at the doll, crushed it, and thought that he had a bad feeling about it. After that, June asked what the next plan was. Park thought that if it weren't for Marley's help, he would have died at the hands of Karan. Park planned that he lacked information and power, so he needed Jun's help finding a place where he could secretly grow his strength. Back at the cathedral, the warrior was standing in front of a Parla look-alike statue. A lilac-haired guy approached the warrior and told him that someone wanted to see him because that person knew about the identity of the demon. The person came toward the warrior and showed her face. It was Dora Captain. Dora acknowledged the warrior as a true warrior because he had divine energy flowing through him. She asked the warrior for a favor. She needed the warrior to seek revenge for her junior who went into a coma, and she wanted to join the warrior's group. At the underground fighting arena, a man with blue skin entered the arena. All the people cheered for him and placed their bets. The next challenger, named Champ Tiger, was actually Park with soldier paint on his face. Marley and June sat in the audience seat to watch the match. When the match started, the blue-skinned guy was about to punch Park. Park showed a surprised face, but somehow the match ended quickly with Park defeating the blue-skinned guy and shouts, Next! Another opponent steps onto the ground and begins to kick Park, but he quickly counters with a punch to the chest, defeating him. The crowd cheers as they witness the new guy's unbeatable skills. Park takes home the prize money and celebrates with Marley and June over a meal. Suddenly, a man enters and recognizes Park from the fight. He compliments Park on his performance and offers to buy him a protein drink. He asks if Park is from Manwool, a place where people like him live, including many wanted criminals. The Empire treats them like garbage and ignores them. The man warns Park to be careful of Friday an A-rank fighter and the strongest in the underground arena who has returned to the Empire. Suddenly, 
A heavy man enters and pushes the waiter, demanding more fried chicken. He scolds the waiter for interrupting his sacred chicken and beer time. At the bar inn, June introduced the Fighter Friday as the eighth-ranked fighter on the A-rank list. Jun also mentioned that Kareem was ranked 10th on the list, meaning that Friday was much stronger than Kareem. Marley asked Park if he needed any help, but Park didn't have any specific request. However, he did have a funny plan in mind. Meanwhile, at a restaurant in the back street, Friday was enjoying his meal of golden fried chicken and beer when Park suddenly sat down and asked for a bite. Friday felt insulted by Park's intrusion and called him Champ Tiger. Since Friday knew about Park's identity as a fighter, Park decided to cut to the chase and ask for a fight. Friday explained that he fights in underground arenas because the taste of chicken after a victory is very special. He thought that Park was a worthless fighter and asked him to leave. However, Park provoked him by saying that pizza was more nutritious than trashy fried chicken. Friday became angry and Park challenged him to a fight in the next underground arena match. Park insulted Friday, saying that if he ignored the challenge, it would mean that pizza tastes better than chicken. The crowd thought Park was crazy and had a death wish, while Friday was impatient and wanted to fight immediately. But Park provoked him by saying that if he did it now, he would flip the table, which would make the fried chicken fall. This made Friday calm down and he called Park a cheap guy and stopped trying to ruin his fried chicken. Park reminded him that the match would be held in a week's time and left the restaurant laughing. When Park arrived at June's hideout, June asked him where he had been. Park replied that he had fixed a match with Friday, and they both laughed at how easy it was to threaten him with chicken. Jun explained that Friday had traveled around the country for almost 10 years, gathering nearly 300 chefs to study chicken cooking skills and cook chicken for him. Park also loved chicken, and June realized he was regretting his decision to threaten Friday with it. June asked Park why he did it. Shortly after, Marley entered the room and told June that Park was not a mindless person. Park asked them to trust him, promising to show them something awesome. A week later, the day of the fight arrived, and both fighters faced each other. Park was focused, and Friday asked him, Are you scared? Park replied, Shut up. I am just concentrating. The announcer declared that today's battle would be legendary. Park kicked Friday, held his head, and threw him to the ground. He told Friday that it would be too early for him to lose the match. Friday got angry and said, Today's beer and chicken will be delicious. Friday about to launch his attack toward Park with Escanor's pose. The fight continued as the two opponents previously defeated by Park watched on in amazement. They never expected Friday to use his secret power in the match. Suddenly, Friday's body began to sparkle, and he gained the properties of carbonic acid. He attacked Park with a sparkling shot that sent him flying, and then he boosted himself forward and punched Park. Although Park managed to stand on his feet, his mouth began to bleed. He remembered June's teaching that shaking a carbonated drink unleashes its power but also leaves the user defenseless. Park seized the opportunity to grab Friday's head and knock him down. Friday stood up and flew into the air, landing on the ground with great force. Park dodged Friday's attack and confidently prepared to counter. Attack but failed and got punched in the face. Everyone watched as Park continued to smile despite the blows he received. Both fighters ran towards each other to attack, and Park defended himself while Friday kept punching. Park waited for the right timing to counter, attack, and landed a serious punch. However, just as he was about to strike, his body began to feel dizzy. Friday revealed that he had smeared a lot of sparkling on his body, and his final blow would cause the sparkling inside Park's body to explode. Park's body exploded, and he was left injured and lying on the floor. Park falls to the ground, his body severely damaged and unable to defend himself. June and Marley are worried about the situation. Friday says that this wouldn't have happened if Park hadn't humiliated the chicken. Friday then compliments Park, stating that it was the best fight he had in a while. Suddenly, a dark aura appears, and Friday begins to feel fear. He turns back to look at Park, who is attempting to stand up. Park who had displeased the goddess Parla and was sent down without any ability, has now awakened some magic in his body. Friday is frozen with fear and cannot believe that Park survived that hit.
He runs towards Park again and tries to attack him, but Park punches him in the face. Friday flips in the air and falls on the ground, his mouth bleeding. He's about to punch again, but Park kicks him in the chest, breaking Friday's ribs and sending him flying. Park approaches Friday and steps on his head, laughing evilly, scaring the audience. Marley and June see that something is wrong with Park. Friday understands Park's condition, which is mana overload. June thinks this is a rare genetic condition that occurs twice in the world, where an individual is born without magic but gains it, and their mana and life energy are consumed, eventually leading to death. Friday shouts at Park, saying that he will not let him die because of mana overload and he wants to kill him with his own hands for humiliating his chicken. However, Park tells Friday that he is the one who is going to get beat into a pulp. Marley sees the situation and speaks to June, asking if this was the thing he wanted to show her. She's outraged, Marley shouted. Is that all the revenge you wanted? Park realized his mistake and knew that he could not die now. He recalled how Goddess Parla had treated him, which made him angry. Park started to punch himself several. After some beating, Park managed to turn back to normal and asked Friday to continue the fight. Friday was surprised and smiled. He understood that Park was using his own magic to hit himself to stop the mana overload. Friday told Park that he was the craziest guy he had ever met and warned him that he would do anything to defeat him now. Park used his mana to cover his body and got into a fighting stance. Friday used his sparkling to pour into his body powering himself up and ready to launch his strongest shot. He immediately ran behind Park and was about to strike him when Park realized he didn't have enough time to dodge it. He landed a punch on Friday's fist head on. Park seemed overpowered by Friday, but he was still smiling. Park then used his mana to make a shovel as a weapon with his left hand. Friday was surprised that Park intended to defeat him with his half-crippled body. Park struck Friday with the shovel and he fell to the ground. The audience looked on with jaws dropped in shock as Park won the match. Feeling relieved, Park fell to the ground. As he was about to hit the ground, Marley grabbed him and told him he did a good job. At June's hideout, Park is lying on a bed, seriously injured and covered in wounds. Marley is sitting beside him, looking after him. June inquires about Park's condition, which is quite bad. However, Marley smiles, saying that he did his best and deserves a reward. She then uses her magical powers to heal Park's wounds. When Park wakes up, he looks at Marley and asks why her hair is short. Marley had used up most of her energy and power to heal Park. Meanwhile, Jun, disguised as a girl, walks through the streets of the village, searching for help to find a new residence for Marley and Park. She heads to Reek, who she knows can assist them. Riku runs a bakery and also works for the Manwell organization. But to her surprise, there is no line of customers today. And when she peeks inside the bakery, she sees soldiers standing inside and Riku bound in ropes. June is shocked to see a lilac hair guy officer there and asks what's going on. The officer asks if Jun is a customer, and June responds by asking him the same question. The officer tells June that they are interrogating Riku because he is a member of the Manwool organization. Jun decides to leave quietly, not wanting to cause any more trouble. However, the lilac hair guy stops him and angrily subjects him to an investigation as well. Jun finds out that he is actually Hone, the first place a rank Imperial Knight Commander. At Riku's bakery, Han called Jun inside and accused his of being a member of the Manwool organization, informing him that he was now under investigation. Riku, who was observing the situation, intervened and asked Han to release Jun. In the past, Riku had asked Jun to dress up as a girl in case he needed his assistance in tricky situations. Despite Riku's defense, Han remained suspicious and ordered Jun to leave. As Jun was leaving, Han kicked Riku and threatened to send all the members of the Manwool organization in their custody to the doctor. Upon hearing this, Jun rushed to Park and Marley for help. Park had recovered enough to practice his new moves. When Jun arrived and asked for their assistance in saving his organization's members, both Marley and Park were sitting at a table discussing their plan. Park expressed gratitude towards Jun for helping him gain entry into the Empire and improve his superpowers through the arena. He then asked Jun if he saw him as a colleague. Marley warned Park to be careful with his words, but 
Park told her to shut up, stating that they were only friends because they needed something from each other. He explained that it didn't make sense for them to rescue June's comrades with their half-recovered bodies, which were caught by the strongest A-ranker. Park warned them not to cross the line. Despite Park's demeanor, Marley thought he was a rational person, and she told him that she also considered Jun as one of her colleagues. She advised Park to rest and recover his body while she helped June with the rescue mission. Marley brought June out for their mission while Park reminisced about their memories together. Suddenly, Park smashed the table into pieces and called Marley a stupid bastard. Jun and Marley disguised themselves with bush costumes and hid behind a bush. Marley wondered why Jun didn't want to use his transformation ability, and Jun explained that he had to consume a part of the subject's body to transform. However, the more different the subject was from humans, the more pressure it put on his body. Jun revealed that he had brought this just in case to minimize the pressure on his body which he got from his captain, but didn't know what it was. His captain had told him to only use it when he really needed it, and June thought saving his comrades was the right time. Marley wasn't convinced, but agreed anyway. As a group of soldiers escorted the criminals, June noticed that the A-ranker was not present, and he saw it as their chance. However, just as they were about to make their move, a big muscle guy wearing a mask appeared behind them, making June and Marley sweat with fear of being discovered. Marley used her flame ability to burn the muscle guy, attracting the soldier's attention. June was momentarily distracted, but Marley reminded him to stay focused. She assured him that she could handle the muscle guy alone and told him to rescue his comrades. However, just as June was about to consume the pill he brought, another muscle guy appeared in front of him. They were both surrounded by two muscle guys, and June got punched in the face, dropping the pill. Marley was also distracted and got pinned down by one of the muscle guys. Helpless, they were in despair. Suddenly, a man walked over, picked up June's pill, and called them a bunch of idiots for their actions. He sarcastically referred to them as comrades. Park easily defeated the two muscle guys and scolded them for their incompetence, questioning how they would survive in the future if they kept getting defeated so easily. He then told June to use his ability wisely. June is touched by Park's help and compliments him for it, but Park brushes it off and tells June not to flatter him. Park then reminds June that he promised to repay him for helping him. June finds Park's words somewhat insulting, as it implies that Park helped June solely out of obligation. Park leaves, and June June still insists on needing Park's help by grabbing Park's leg. Marley smiles and calls him son to Rick. Park is surprised and asks Marley where she learned those words. After that, the three of them prepare for their journey. There's a creepy guy who seems to enjoy looking at small creatures. Han notices this and comments on the guy's happiness. The guy tosses the small creature away and asks Han if he wants to hear a funny story. Han, without showing any emotion, bluntly tells him that he is curious and wants to know. The creepy guy informs Han that the two muscle guys he sent have lost communication with him, which means they are either unconscious or dead. Han understands the situation and suggests they stop the Manwell troops and leave their current location to start their mission. Jun discovers that Hone is hiding in a building and Park feels it could be a trap. Marley advises them not to stay in one place for too long to avoid the enemy calling for reinforcements. Park understands and tells Marley to return to the hideout, as he needs her in the future plan. If anything happens before that, he may have to exclude her from the mission, no matter what. Marley understands and fuses herself into Park's arm as a flame tattoo. Park thinks it's fine that way, and he and June begin their invasion while Hone waits inside the building. Park begins by crawling on the ground towards the guards, then stands up and attacks them. Meanwhile, June jumps on the head of another guard and uses a napkin to render him unconscious. After entering the gate, they monitor the situation through a door's hole and find six soldiers and six hostages, all tied up with masks on their faces. June asks Park to finish them all quickly. Park attacks the door and breaks it into pieces, and both of them enter the hall. The troops start shouting and yelling Manuel has arrived. Park attacks the troops, but June runs towards the prisoners to cut their ropes and remove their masks. However, he becomes shocked after seeing one of the prisoners who calls him an idiot. All the prisoners remove their masks and start running towards Jun, attacking him. Park and June soon realize it was a trap. Park manages to defeat all the troops. 
and both the creepy guy and Hone come downstairs and walk towards them. Hone finds out that there are only two enemies and feels disappointed. The creepy guy begins laughing after seeing Jun and realizes that he has grown up so well, almost not recognizing him. Jun recalls a memory of the creepy guy holding hands with him while watching a creature being kidnapped. The creepy guy looked at Jun and addressed Han, telling him to leave the kid to him and mentioning that it wasn't finished yet. Han didn't mind and told him that he could do whatever he wanted after the interrogation. Jun recalled memories of the creepy guy torturing him before, which made him feel uneasy. Park was angry about this and punched the creepy guy in the face, causing his mouth to start bleeding. Park then moved forward to attack him again, but Hone managed to stop Park's punch and hit him instead, causing Park to fall to the ground. Now. Both Park and June were sitting on the ground helpless. June thought that it was his fault for this situation and thanked Park for still staying with him. Park gave him a pill and stood up, transforming into his new form. Han looked at him and realized that Park knew how to use magic. He ordered the troops to catch him, but Park was ready to launch his attack. As the troops came near him, Park threw them all away. Meanwhile, June swallowed the pill and his body started transforming into something scarce. Everyone, including Han, the strongest A-ranked, began to fear him as he became like a beast and started roaring. Park was surprised at seeing him like this. Marley also became surprised and called June's son. A young man appeared on the battlefield and spoke to a creature, asking why they were fighting each other. Suddenly, the scene changed and Han was recalling his memory. Sweating profusely, June was surprised by what he had become and asked Park how he looked, but Park didn't know how to respond. Then, a creepy guy threw a toy on the floor, which opened its mouth and said hello before attacking Park and June. The toy grew two projection hands and held them against the wall. The creepy guy laughed and asked Han if it was okay to crush his men. The toy was about to crush them both when Park urged Jun to use his flashily transformed abilities. Jun thought of Marley, who told him to crush the toy with his teeth. Jun followed Marley's advice, crushing the toy's hand with his sharp teeth, and they were free. Meanwhile, Han went to look after his men and addressed the creepy guy as doctor when facing Park and Jun. June informed Park that Doctor had the ability to mold anything in his hand with his clay ability, which was potentially boundless. Doctor threw the toy's remaining pieces at them, but Park redirected it, causing it to explode. Park then hit Doctor on the head, but the attack didn't seem to affect him because he used his ability on his head. June cut Doctor's hand with his sharp claws, but Doctor attached it back with his ability. Then, Doctor summoned one of his friends, and a heavy, devil-like man entered. Doctor introduced him to June, and June was shocked to see that it was Riku, the bakery owner. Tears welled up in June's eyes as Riku walked towards him and suggested that Jun become a woman and wear a bikini whenever he visited him. Park facepalmed at the comment while Marley felt disgusted. Park asked Jun if this was the person they had to rescue, but Jun was too sad to respond and inform Park that he had been modified. Doctor laughed evilly and warned them not to let their guard down just because of Riku's personality. Suddenly, Riku spewed a substance that looked like acid towards them, and both June and Park jumped to defend themselves. The acid fell on the ground and melted everything in its path. Park asked June about Riku's ability, but June didn't know as Riku had also been modified. Riku then sprayed a fluid from his mouth that acted as a dissolvent, dissolving anything it came in contact with. Park thought of creating a shield to protect himself, and he managed to save himself from the toxic liquid. However, June fell and the liquid dissolved everything around him. He thought he was going to die, but he miraculously survived. June was amazed by this creature's abilities and thought they might be able to escape, but Doctor suddenly raised clay around them, trapping them inside. Doctor ordered Riku to attack again, and Riku roared, filling the room with toxic clouds. Both June and Park found themselves completely trapped inside an enclosed space. Jun, being a creature, was able to tolerate the clouds of dissolvent to some extent, but Park couldn't bear the toxicity. Hence, he resorted to another trick and used his mana to dress up like a diver with a mask covering his mouth. Park asked June to find a way out from there while he dealt with Riku. However, Riku managed to land a non-serious punch on Park, surprising both Jun and Marley. Park had slowed down because he had used up all his mana to defend himself. June tried to attack the wall, but it regenerated back, and he began to worry that if Han returned to the fight, it would be impossible for them to escape. 
Marley then approached June and told him that he wasn't using the real power of the creature. She lent her power to Jun and he began to transform, unleashing the real power of the Vave tribe. Meanwhile, the doctor was smiling, knowing that in three minutes, both Jun and Park would die due to the toxic cloud. However, the wall of clay suddenly broke and both Jun and Park were able to break free. Jun was now in full power and ready to attack the doctor. Returning to the inside of the clay, Marley empowers Jun while Park fights against Riku. Riku uses his forehead pimple to expel a wave of poison at Park, but Park manages to dodge it and feels disgusted by the attack. He describes the feeling as making his heart drop and his body dull and bland. Riku then grabs Park and unleashes all of his bodily fluids while hugging him, making it impossible for Park to fight back. When Park is ready to continue his fight, Riku's body suddenly starts breaking and dissolving into several pieces. Both Jun and Marley witness Riku's demise, and Jun runs towards him, telling him to wake up so they can escape together. However, Riku apologizes to Jun and tells him that he can't come with them. Instead, Riku has a last message for Jun. There is a secret maid uniform in his secret drawer. He asks Jun if he will wear it, and then puts his hand on Jun's head, telling him he will watch him from the sky. Riku's eyes slowly close as he passes away. Back in the present, Jun is crying and attacks the doctor. The doctor is surprised by Jun's anger and laughs, asking if it's because of that. The doctor tells Jun that he can make that creature again, but Jun cuts the doctor's hand with his sharp claw in a fit of anger. Jun was about to consume the doctor, but Park intervened by kicking him. Jun was puzzled by this and asked him why he did it. Suddenly, a slash cut through an entire building, splitting the floor and walls into two pieces. Eyes appeared from the gap in the wall, revealing Han, who broke open the other half of the wall and was ready to fight. Jun and Park fell to the ground, their faces bleeding. Han emerged from the smoke, holding a stick of wood. Park became enraged and ran toward Han to attack him, but Marley stopped him. Despite this, Park punched Han, who retaliated with a powerful blow from his stick that left Park's mouth bleeding heavily. Han urged Park to stop fighting because his injuries were severe and his body was almost disabled. However, Park refused to give up and stood up, determined to crush anyone who had insulted him, even if they were gods. Han thought that Park was just all talk and asked if he had anything else to say. Park replied that there was more, but Han struck him with a powerful Gitsuga Tenshao attack. Both Jun and Park are lying face down on the ground. The doctor, who appears to be a 6th A ranker, goes near them and looks at them carefully. He asks Han when he can have these two, and Hon replies that he can send Jun to him earlier. Park opens his eyes in a new location, which is revealed to be an Imperial concentration camp. An old man approaches him and throws water at him. When Park opens his eyes, he asks the old man where he is. The old man tells Park to shut up and threatens him with a sharp object. Park asks if they are going to torture him, and the old man confirms that they are before approaching Park while holding a pink box. Park breaks free from his restraints and throws a troop away while claiming that he cannot lose his mustache and long hair. The old man takes out a wanted poster and looks at it, and suddenly Park becomes obedient. They remove Park's facial hair, and the old man thinks that Park looks pretty with short hair, while Park is crying inside. After that, a troop throws Park into a cell, claiming that this is his new home. The thing on Park's throat interrupts the flow of mana, and he can't even think about escaping. Marley comes into his thoughts and apologizes to him. Park asks where June is, and Marley replies that they have sent him to the doctor. Park realizes that Hone and the doctor reacted differently after June transformed into a creature and asks Marley about the creature's race. Marley mentions that this creature is a tribe called Bapes in the Parlin world, created by Marley's power. It was Parley's suggestion to create a new race with her, and Marley accepted it, but it was a trap. Park feels bad for Marley being bullied by someone like Parla, which triggers an argument about Parla personality and how easily they get betrayed by her. Suddenly, Marley realizes that the reason Parla summoned Park to be a warrior might all just be a facade. Park sat alone in the jail, laughing to himself. He had thought everything was his fault, but now he realized that the goddess Parla had given him a chance at her own expense. Suddenly, he heard someone enter the hall and turned to see a woman coming towards him. It was an investigator named Sister Ray. She warned him that he would not be laughing for long, as the investigation had just begun. Two heavy bodyguards then entered the room and picked up Park, taking him into another room where they tied his hands 
and hung him up with iron chains from the roof. Sister Ray began questioning him, asking where the other members of the Manwell organization were located. Park replied that he didn't know. Sister Ray didn't believe him and had two men with masks bring in a table with a pan on top and a fire burning below. She cracked an egg onto the pan and said she would fry it while she waited for Park to speak. Park demanded that Sister Ray take off the eggshell before flipping it. But Sister Ray continued to flip the egg, which triggered Park's feelings. Just then, a man entered the room and told Sister Ray that Jun's testimony had revealed that Park knew nothing, and even the Man Wool organization didn't know him. Sister Ray was shocked and apologized to Park, explaining that he had been caught mistakenly. She then revealed that Friday was also in the jail and that she would cook something delicious for Park. Park asked for fried chicken, and Sister Ray promised to make it for him. Later, Park entered the dining hall carrying a plate of fried chicken. Friday was surprised to see Park and asked why he was there. Park explained that he wanted to clear up the misunderstanding and offered Friday a drumstick as an apology. Friday initially refused, but Park offered him two drumsticks, and Friday feel touched. Friday savors the texture of the chicken and eagerly takes a bite, expressing his delight. It had been so long since he had enjoyed the taste of chicken, and he was thrilled to finally have it again. However, he quickly realizes he has overindulged, lamenting that he's only eaten two pieces when he usually enjoys at least 30. Park tears a piece of chicken in two and starts eating, which prompts Friday to grab him by the collar and lift him up, asking angrily if he really likes chicken or not. Park explains that, in his world, there was a lot of competition between chicken restaurants and only the best chicken survive. He extends his hand to Friday, suggesting that they should work together to change the world. Friday sits back down on the ground while Park walks away, saying that he will await Friday's answer. Later, in the prisoner workshop, Marley asks Park if Friday has given him an answer yet. Park responds that he's still waiting for it. As Park continues to work with the other prisoners, Friday approaches him and says he's eaten a lot of chicken worldwide, but he's never heard of the place Park mentioned. He asks Park who he really is, and Park responds that he's Park Byung Jang, the devil of Oracle, and he's from another world. Friday bursts out laughing and says he'll bet on Park. A month later, the other prisoners gossip about how Park is the newest member of the Manwool organization. He's formed a team of prisoners who work for the guards and are loved by them. While leading his team, Park helps discipline the unruly prisoners. Suddenly, Park and his team appear and he tells all the prisoners to work hard. Park and Friday found themselves together in jail, where they were feared by all the other prisoners. Park told Friday about their first plan to break out of jail. But Friday pointed out that their magic was sealed and they wouldn't be able to do it without it. Park then revealed his trump card, a tattoo of Marley on his hand. However, he acknowledged that it wouldn't be enough and they needed more talented people to execute their plan. He asked Friday if he knew anyone who could be of use, but Friday could only think of chicken. Park was surprised that the day had come when he would miss Jun. Friday then mentioned Gelro, an information goblin who might be able to help them as he was crazy about money and would sell any information he had. Even if he got caught, they found Gelro sitting alone and told him their plan, but Gelro initially refused, having realized his mistake of being blinded by money. He told Park and Friday to leave, but Park sarcastically shouted that he wanted to be the richest man in the world and share some business ideas with Gelro, which caught his attention. Park then pitched his idea of a food delivery business, which touched Gelro and Friday. Gelro was surprised by Park's idea, which actually was not his own. However, Gelro was hesitant to help Park because he was from Manwal. But Park suddenly offered a 50-50 profit share, which instantly convinced Gelro to help him. He kneeled down and promised to share whatever information Park needed. Park asked Gelro to tell him about the most vicious and socially excluded people in jail. Gelro introduced them to the murderous sisters, Cindy and Bella who believed that true beauty was strength. Park easily recruited them by defeating them with his own strength and complimenting them. Gelro also mentioned Manji, who couldn't be recruited by force as he lived in the non-faith and society world and conquered wild animals by himself in the mountains. However, Park managed to recruit Manji by playing with him using a cat teaser feature toy. Lastly, Gelro talked about the witch, Agari, who had the devil living in her mouth. Sister Ray entered the warden's office, 
expressing her concerns about the atmosphere in the prison. She mentioned that the murderous sisters, Manji, Gelro, and even Friday were under Park's influence and suspected that something suspicious was going on. The warden reassured Sister Ray that there was no need to worry since he was a second in rank, known as father and one of the best in the empire. He advised Sister Ray to relax and observe how things played out. Meanwhile, all the prisoners were gathered outside with Park holding a mick and facing a Gary in the center. Park announced that a diss battle would take place and explained that it was a sport fought through slander and undermining opponents' mental strength. Agari was hesitant at first, but Park convinced her to join. When Agari began speaking, everyone started losing their mind and bleeding started from their ears and nose. Despite this, Park remained standing and looked okay, but he started bleeding from his ear. Agari's men accused Park of pretending, but he continued to speak and made everyone cry, even Agari. Eventually, both Park and Agari started to slander each other, and everyone in the crowd lost their mind. However, they both enjoyed the situation and even shook hands afterward. Park invited Agari to join his team, along with her two men, Dal and Jetta. Park was sitting in his cell when Marley came out and sit on the bench. Although she appeared sad, she sarcastically remarked that Park had become quite popular. When Park asked if she was jealous, she simply replied, shut up. Marley then asked Park why he was making these friends, to which he replied that his head had cleared up and he now understood why Parlia had called him to this world. He realized that Parla's true plan was to turn him into a demon, as she needed a demon and a warrior to balance out the chaos of the world. Therefore, Park knew he had to build the strongest army possible and destroy all of Parla's plans, starting by killing the warrior. Marley reminded Park of their earlier conversation about how Parla's plan was to have him fight the warrior. Park told Marley that he had a different plan to overwhelm the warrior without actually fighting him. Marley reminded Park that the warrior was a god and it wouldn't be easy to defeat him. Park, however, was confident and told Marley that she herself was a god. Marley smiled, impressed by Park's confidence even though he was in jail. A soldier, who was actually brown in disguise, was listening to their conversation behind the door of Park's cell and reported everything to Parliai. A month later, an old man was cleaning the floor of the prison and noticed that the atmosphere had changed due to Park's influence. The prison had become more comfortable and the prisoners had formed a group advocating for a reduction of sentences. Most of the guards seemed to like Park as well. When Park saw the old man, he greeted him, and the old man thought that Park was a sweet person. He even wished that Park could be his son-in-law if he weren't a prisoner and mentioned that he had five daughters. The old man also told Park that he wished to work in the prison forever. Park silently thought to himself that it was too bad that it wouldn't happen anymore. After that encounter, Park gathered his team to talk about his plan for sentence reduction. However, his true plan was actually to break out of prison. Everyone was happy about it, except for Gelro, who had thought that he would be able to reduce his sentence by doing community service and starting a business. Friday patted Gelro on the shoulder, indirectly telling him that he had been tricked. Park then used the flame tattoo on his hand and Marley came out of him. Marley created a shovel for Park, and she destroyed all of the team's mana breaker, which had allowed them to use mana to escape from prison. Park's team began their plan. The troops immediately recognized Park after seeing his strange flame and outfit with a green shovel, identifying him as the Devil of the Oracle. Park's team was also surprised to learn of his true identity, fearing that attempting to escape would result in their execution. However, Park insisted that they must cross the untouchable line instead of living in hiding for the rest of their lives. He tested his team, instructing them to survive until he gave the signal before departing from the area. The troops moved to stop Park's team, who began to prepare for a fight. Park and Marley watched from atop a building as Park's team engaged in battle with the troops. Park urged Marley that they needed to rescue their poor child, Jun, and they departed for the prison. Meanwhile, inside the Empire, Warden was having a lunch meeting with other Empire members. They discussed the agenda for the meeting, which was the possible sentence reduction for the Manuel member. Sister Ray strongly opposed the idea, and other members hesitated to make a decision. Suddenly, a troop entered the room and informed them that Park's team had already cut off their mana breaker and attempted to escape. Sister Ray was delighted to learn that the black-haired guy was suspicious 
but it indirectly offended the warden since he, too, had black hair. The troop also informed the warden that Park was from the Devil of the Oracle. Warden was surprised that someone so ridiculous was inside his prison and ordered his troops to kill any prisoners attempting to escape. The warden then ordered the troops to bring Captain Hahn for reinforcement and they began their journey. Back to Park, he had already located June's cell, guarded by a single guard. However, Park easily defeated him. Park and Marley found June in his cell and managed to save him. June was touched tears streaming down his face as he apologized to Park. Meanwhile, Park's team gathered to discuss their next steps. Friday decided to split off and look for clothes, while murderous sisters and agorized team bid their farewells, hoping everyone would survive the prison break. This left Gelro and Manji. Manji tried to leave on his own, but Gelro was worried and insisted on accompanying him. Park's team then decided to return to their original form and wait for their captain's return. The murderous sisters defeated some of the troops and were searching for an escape when they were suddenly approached by the knight of the prison. Despite facing each other, the murderous sisters thought both knights looked soft and weak. The fight began with the female knight kicking Bella, causing her to stumble back. Cindy attempted to avenge her teammate, but the knight quickly stopped her. In response, the female knight released a cloud of smoke that enveloped Cindy. After the smoke cleared, Cindy's muscles had disappeared and she had become a skinny girl. Bella attacked both knights in anger. However, both knights easily dodged her kicks. The knight known as Dirt Needle told them that his ability was to inject a special stinger into their blood, which gently relaxed the muscles. The female knight named Arafi showed them the smoke from her sword, which had a powerful massage effect that maximized their mental and physical stability. Bella unleashed her ability to create toughened glass shoes, and Cindy used her ability to set her fists on fire with pumpkin flames. Dirt Needle told Arafi to handle Cindy for a moment while he dealt with Bella. Dirt Needle threw a lot of needles at Bella, but she managed to dodge them. Arafi slashed at Cindy, but she used her boxing stance to dodge all the slashes. Bella rapidly kicked Dirt Needle with her leg, but he was able to block the attack and tried to find a moment to counterattack whenever she broke in the middle of breathing. Bella lifted the floor to block the attack and then kicked the lifted floor to break through it and land a kick on Dirt Needle. Dirt Needle fell to the ground and felt angry, determined to destroy all her muscles. Meanwhile, back with Park and June, Park told Jun that he had new colleagues waiting anxiously for him. Jun was surprised and asked about it. Park explained that while trying to save Jun, he had caused some trouble and left his colleagues to deal with it. Marlion decided not to call them colleagues anymore. Jun felt worried about whether their colleagues had really died. Park implied that if they had died, it meant they were not needed it. Park told Jun that it was just a joke and that he trusted their colleagues to handle the trouble. Jun and Marley knew that Park was lying but understood that he had likely recruited new colleagues to help avenge Parlia. Jun expressed concern for their safety, but Marley noted that they were likely too weak to handle the situation except for Friday. Marley understood Park's personality well enough to know that if they couldn't handle it, he would abandon them. Meanwhile, Cindy was on the ground trying to stand up while Bella had lost all her muscle and was getting beaten badly by Dirt Needle. Despite feeling like she was going to lose, Bella remembered her captain, Park, and their conversation about true strength. She had told Park that physical strength can be overcome with effort and that it goes beyond its limits. Park had encouraged her to think outside of her own thoughts and show her what true strength was. Bella understood what Park meant and she mustered up the strength to keep fighting. Arafi realized that something was wrong with her and pushed Dirt Needle away to safety. Bella unleashed an aura around her to power up. Both knights understood her intentions and prepared to use their full power. They began their fight with their last bit of strength. Bella threw multiple projectiles at Dirt Needle, who dashed through all of them and threw needles back at her. Bella moved forward and kicked Dirt Needle, but he grabbed her leg and threw her down. Arafi was about to stab Bella with her sword, but Cindy managed to stop her attack and send her flying. Dirt Needle wondered why the murderous sisters were still standing and why they wouldn't collapse. He threw needles at them and was slashed by Arafi as well. Yet the murderous sisters were able to stand up again and rush toward them. Dirt Needle began to feel fear 
and changed his mind to kill the enemy quickly and used his final move on them. The murderous sisters had been waiting for this moment. Bella stopped his final move and Cindy used her vines to capture both of them. The murderous sisters put all their strength together to work as a team. They charged their attack toward Dirt Needle and Arify, who were powerless to stop it. They fell on the ground, and so did the murderous sisters. But Dirt Needle managed to stand up on his own and told them there was no next time for them. He moved towards them while the murderous sisters couldn't do anything with their weakened bodies. Suddenly, Park appeared behind him and told him to move for a second. Park grabbed Dirt Needle's head and pushed him against the wall, knocking him unconscious and defeating him. Park helped Cindy and Bella and told them that they had passed the test. Agari and her two men were at the mercy of Captain Ice Gaither, who was in second place in the B rank. She did not even give Agari a chance to speak and quickly took her down, ordering her colleagues to tie down both men. Gaither beat Agari in strength, judgment, and speed leaving Agari with no way to fight back. Gaither told Agari that she should repent and join Parlagatis to avoid pain in her death. Agari refused, angering Gaither, who kicked her and pulled her hair. Sister Ray warned Agari's men not to try anything to help her, or else she would kill them. Gaither then provoked Agari, telling her that she was nothing special even if she joined the devil, and that she was still a weak and incompetent criminal. Gaither held Agari's hand and warned her to repent again. Agari recalled her past when she was abandoned in the back alley and ended up in an orphanage before being taken to prison. She thought that dirty talk was her only defense mechanism. Agari then challenged Park to a diss battle again, but Park declined, telling her that he would only speak one word, and if she could withstand it, he would admit defeat. Park dealt some emotional damage to Agari, causing her to question herself and think that she was a failure. However, Park also advised her to take advantage of her weakness and trick opponents into revealing their own weaknesses. Back in the present, Agari wanted to repent, and Gaither was happy to hear that and prayed to Parla Goddess. Agari used this opportunity to deal emotional damage to Gaither, causing her and her team to lose their minds, nosebleed, and lose consciousness. Even Agari's men fell for her tactics, and she was thrilled that she had defeated them all. In the dining hall, a chef has been cooking in the prison camp for about 10 years. He is cooking fried chicken for Friday, but Friday criticizes his cooking skills after failing several times. Friday starts questioning whether he is even a cook. The chef mentions that he is not a fried chicken expert, which angers Friday scolding him for having no pride as a chef. Friday tells the chef that not being an expert in fried chicken is just an excuse. The chef recalls his past, where he was defeated by genius cooks in a similar character we could find from cooking anime. He starts feeling despair because he could not see himself as good as those geniuses, so he started working as a chef in prison. His eyes, which once sparkled when he was young, are now as dark as pitch black towards cooking. But Friday reminds him of his true purpose. Friday understands by looking at the chef's eyes and requests fried chicken again. The chef wants to make sure that Friday will say the words it's delicious while putting salt in a salt bay manner. The chef prepares the fried chicken for Friday, who starts eating it and feels like he's in heaven. Friday compliments the chef about the chicken. After that, Kareem and Dora appear in front of Friday. Kareem understands that he should not disturb Friday's chicken moment, but that he is sure that he came at the right time to fight Friday. Back to Park, he is on top of the building looking at a Gary's battle. Park has a conversation with his colleague. June is surprised that Park calls them subordinates and is surprised that the murderous sister, Agari, Friday, Gelro, and Mongji are recruited by Park. Park is happy that Agari has passed the test, but is a bit disappointed with her men. Cindy asks about Gelro and Manji, and Park mentions that they already passed from the start because they were already a finished product in the first place. Cindy and Bella ask about Friday's test, and Cindy thinks that Friday is weaker than what his rank states, which lost to Park. Park explains that during their battle, the mana overload that happened to Park in the middle of their fight caused damage to Friday that was only 20. The other 80 of his injuries were caused by mana overload. It means that Friday is actually a lot stronger than Park. Friday easily dominated Kareem and Dora, leaving them trembling in fear of him. Friday left sparkling all over the place, which caused the floor to explode 
and Kareem fell to the ground while Friday looked down on him. Friday told Kareem to stop disturbing his dream to change the world. But Kareem became mad and scolded Friday, assuming that Friday must have sold his soul to the devil's tongue after hearing a sweet story from the devil while in prison. Kareem used an example to explain his point, and Friday agreed with him. However, Kareem also explained that Friday is stronger than him because of his ridiculous and futile dream. Kareem tried to help Friday not fall into the devil's nonsense, saying that chicken is nothing. However, Friday felt insulted and attacked Kareem. Dora saved Kareem by using her wisdom power, which Chief Hiona had given her, giving her a horn on her head. Dora made a cute face toward Friday. She used this moment to slash at Friday with her blade, and Kareem also landed a punch on Friday. The fighting continued, but Friday was joyful that he finally had the chance to eat chicken that was worth it. However, Dora and Kareem were at their limits, and Friday defeated both of them with one sparkling punch. Friday then told Kareem that he was being too passive and should use his ability. Friday provoked Kareem, questioning if he was unable to use it. Kareem couldn't believe that his beliefs were right, which was the condition to use the ability. Friday reminded Kareem of the disaster in the past where Kareem killed most of the Bape tribe with his own hands. And when he saw Warden, Warden told Kareem that he would protect this world and his children. But after the battle, he started to question himself while looking at another Bape tribe, hugging each other in their last moment. Meanwhile, Warden suddenly appeared on the walkway of the building and approached Park with a blue aura. Park welcomed him. Marley reminded Park to focus and told him to consider a Gary situation. Park thought that Warden was going for him. Warden used an ability that seemed like a gravity ability, forcing Agari to kneel down. Warden came closer to Agari and told her that this was the weight of a father's responsibility to his child, asking if she knew how her father felt. Agari just told Warden that she didn't know anything about her father, and Warden felt bad for her. He told her that her father was watching her from heaven. The situation was a bit awkward, but Warden took out his sword and prepared to kill Agari. Suddenly, a gunshot sound rang out and hit Warden's leg. It turned out that Park was using his gun to shoot between the gaps in Warden's armor. Park commanded his team to charge towards Warden, not to attack but to save their teammate and escape from Warden's grasp. Warden tried to stop their escape, but Park managed to hit him on the head with his shovel. Park commanded all of his teammates to break out of jail first and help tell Friday to come to him. Warden tried to stop them, but Park used his shovel to flip the floor, making Warden fly far away from his teammates. Warden was surprised by Park's decision-making and execution, which were totally different from what he had expected from the Devil of the Oracle. Warden had to stop this, otherwise the worst war in the world might happen. Warden jumped back to the building to fight with Park. Park was surprised that he had shot Warden's leg, but Warden was still moving fine. Warden was disappointed in Park and talked about his thoughts toward him, but Park was just calmly thinking about how to defeat Warden. Warden took out his book and used one of his skills, a genjutsu called The First Time My Daughter Called Me Dad, which reminded Park of his past memory, the first time he ever called someone dad. Park felt emotional about the memory and was unable to move. Warden suddenly took off his helmet, revealing that he was the old man, the janitor from the jail. Warden's name was Father, a second A rank, and his ability was memory ability which converted the emotions he felt in his life into magic and delivered in absolute form to the other person. In other words, Father was strong. Park was taken aback by the appearance of the old man who turned out to be Warden. Warden expressed his disappointment in Park who he thought would become his son-in-law and bring him a grandchild. Park was creeped out by Warden's forward thinking and just when Warden was about to attack him, a flame emerged from Park's body and blew Warden away. Marley helped Park and teased him for crying, but Park hushed her because of Warden's ability. Park realized that Warden's true ability was to turn his emotions into mana, which he could use to buff himself or debuff his opponent. If he deepened his emotions, he would become even stronger, which he did by looking at his family album. Park thought that Warden's ability was dirty. Meanwhile, Friday was disappointed that his chicken was already cold and soggy and lost his appetite. Kareem thought they had a chance to win the fight with Dora, but Friday was just playing around with them to enjoy his chicken later. Despite this, Dora insisted that they wouldn't know if they didn't try, and Friday charged towards her. However, Friday quickly created a distance when Dora tried her cute tactic and understood that the range of her ability was only about two meters. 
He then dashed towards Kareem and punched him rapidly, shooting a Mentos at Dora when she tried to intervene. Friday then landed a kick on Dora, leaving Kareem worried about her. However, Friday dashed back towards Kareem and punched him again. Kareem wondered why he still couldn't use his ability even though he was close to death's door. He suddenly used his ability and demanded that he had to save the world, creating a Bape Tribe Golem. However, his memory traumatized him, causing his ability to break midway. Friday understood Kareem's feelings, but still insisted that he himself had chosen a new path and warned Kareem against staying stagnant. He was about to deliver his final blow to Kareem when Dora shouted for him to stop and called out Kareem's name. Suddenly, Park's team arrived at the dining hall and was surprised to see that Friday had defeated Kareem and Dora. Cindy told Friday that Park needed his help. In Gelro's case, he is terrified and hiding from a knight named Hoodie. Gelro knows Hoodie's ability and, no matter how smart he is, he has no way to escape from him. Hoodie suddenly zips up his hoodie, and when he unzips it, he transforms into a wolf. Hoodie crushes the wall that Gelro is hiding behind, but Gelro manages to survive while protecting Manji. Hoodie's ability is to wear clothes made of animal skin, and if he zips it up to the end of his hair, he can transform into the animal that the cloth is made of. Hoodie is excited to kill Manji because Manji's leather cloth is a rare collection. Gelro insults Hoodie for being ethically okay with killing a child. Hoodie tells Gelro that Manji is a prisoner, and he zips his hoodie up and transforms into an octopus, using his tentacles on them. Back to Park, Warden is surprised to see Marley come out from Park and wonders who she is. Warden uses his ability to buff his team, and his teammates awaken. Warden orders them to stop Park's team from escaping. Park provokes Warden by telling him that he cannot do it alone and needs his team's help. The Warden mentioned the gossip he had heard about Park, that he is good at deceiving people and has a bad temper. Park feels bad that the world thinks poorly of him and Marley laughs at him. Warden unleashes a blast from his sword while thinking about his old memory that his daughter's boyfriend is a delinquent. Park manages to dodge the blast, and he thinks that the environment is not in his favor, so he has to change the fighting location. Park suddenly has an idea and rushes toward Warden, locking Warden's head with his shovel. Park then kicks him into the sky, and Warden goes flying. Suddenly, Friday appears from the sky and uses his powerful attack, Sparkling Lariat, to knock Warden down into a forest area. Friday and Park join forces to defeat Warden, while Park tells Friday that beer in this world tastes better. The Warden was taken aback by the fact that he had to fight Friday, his former colleague. Friday pointed out that since they were no longer colleagues, he could use his full power without worrying about rules and ranking. They were about to begin the fight. As Park destroyed the Warden and kicked him to Friday, Friday grabbed the Warden and flipped him to the ground. Warden immediately used his ability and opened his album book, but Park threw his shovel at the book to prevent him from using his ability. Park and Friday used this opportunity to get close to the Warden. Park used his shovel to strike the Warden while Friday looked on proudly, thinking that Park had improved a lot and might surpass him. The Warden kept getting destroyed by them, but he thought he had to cut the flow and unleash an ability. However, Park commanded Marley to stop the Warden by using her flame and knocking him down. Park and Friday tried to continue their flow and attack the Warden while powering up. They both used the Jojo technique against the Warden rapidly until his armor started tearing off. As Park's team tried to escape as quickly as possible on the walkway of the prison, June reminded them to find Gelro and Manji quickly. June explained that the situation was dire since Kareem regularly came to the Empire to see Han, which meant that Han was close to the prison and could exterminate all of them alone. Back to the fight, Park and Friday felt tired, yet the Warden seemed to look perfectly fine. Even though they had landed their attacks well, the Warden warned them that he couldn't faint and showed off his back muscles, climbing that the parent's responsibility was strong. The Warden was unable to fall down as long as he had a child to protect. Park thought that the situation was bad and told Friday to run away from it. They all started running together and were thinking about a plan to defeat Warden. Park thought of two things that could defeat Warden. Firstly, taking the children of the Warden as hostages, but they did not know anything about Warden's background, 
so this method couldn't be used. Secondly, with a gun since Warden's body armor was broken, it was a perfect time to take this one chance and kill Warden immediately. However, Park was worried that since Warden knew about his gun ability, he might be able to dodge any fatal wound. Friday asked Park what he should do, and Park commanded him to stop Warden from moving for 0.5 seconds so that Park could pierce the heart of the Warden. Meanwhile, Gelro and Manji got caught by Hoodie's tentacle. Hoodie insulted Gelro that being an informant was useless in battle, but Gelro provoked him that information was very important and it could change its value in seconds. Hoodie gave them too much time, and Manji was able to struggle free from the tentacle and cut them into pieces. Gelro's ability had three functions. Firstly, it acted like a GPS eavesdropping device. Secondly, whenever it stuck to an object, it revealed an image of the object's past. And thirdly, it stuck to the opponent and delivered the information that Gelro wanted. Gelro used his second ability on Hoodie's cloth and provided the image towards Manji with his third ability. As a result, Manji's wild instinct kicked in, and he fought with Hoodie. Hoodie changed his form again into an A-class noxious beast Gorni Rodsilius. Hoodie dodged Manji's attack and shot a blast at him. Manji stepped onto the remaining block to jump towards Hoodie. Gelro found Hoodie's new transformation's weakness in both shoulders and used his ability towards Manji to send information to him. Manji took out his blowgun and shot both of Hoodie's shoulders. Hoodie lost his power after being shot. Hoodie felt that he was in danger like he was the prey now. Manji was about to finish him, but he got hit by Trojan. Gelro was ungrateful that his team came late to rescue him. Hoodie felt grateful that he got hit by Trojan because it saved his life by faking his death. Gelro asked about the situation with Park, and Cindy explained to Gelro that Park was fighting with Warden and told them to escape the prison first. Gelro seemed to disbelieve it and insulted Cindy for being a muscle brain. Bella asked what the next plan was, and Gelro gathered information with his ability to find Warden's location and instructed his team to take that direction. Inside the castle of the Empire, the warrior and White were sitting together, while Brown was looking at Han, who was bound by some troops. Han questioned all of them about why he couldn't go to help his men. White insulted Hon, saying that being human, he wouldn't understand words and warned him again to leave the devil alone. This made Han furious, as his men were dying, and he destroyed the binding magic while asking for a reason. Brown was surprised by his power. White then told Han that it was an order from Parla Goddess and provoked him, saying that he couldn't break the goddess's words. Han recalled his past memory of dating a red-haired woman at the aquarium, who told him that she kept thinking that they were just like fish to Parley Goddess. Returning to the fight, Warden was wondering if Park had really run away. However, he thought carefully and realized that Park had already fought many strong opponents in less than half a year. He believed that Park had attained a ranker strength and wouldn't run away from battle like that. Warden saw Park and Marley waiting for him, but Friday intervened and started fighting him. Warden used his ability to throw some swords at Friday and continued his attack with punches. Meanwhile, Park was hiding in the forest with his gun carefully aimed at Warden, waiting for the chance to pierce his heart. However, Warden easily defeated Friday and pushed him to the tree. He used his final attack on Friday, but to Warden's surprise, Friday smiled and ate his sparkling Mentos. This caused him to explode and charge towards Warden. Friday grabbed Warden and jumped into the sky, instructing Park to take the shot. Warden realized their strategy and struggled to break free, all while thinking about his family. Park took the shot, but unfortunately, it missed Warden's heart and hit him in the neck, Warden falling to the ground midair while thinking about his wife, but it somehow unleashes his ability towards the three of them, making them feel emotional. In Warden's past memory, he was an ordinary adventurer hunting monsters for a living, but his eyes gradually grew darker over time. One day, he went to a store, and a beautiful woman caught his eye. He confessed his feelings to her, and she accepted. They got married, had children, and he worked hard as a part-time janitor to provide for his family. He would kill stronger monsters to earn more money, and every time he returned home, he was happy to see his family. He was eventually promoted to the position of warden, which made his wife happy. He looked at a photo of his family with his four daughters, and later, his fifth daughter. 
One day, he came home and found out that his wife had fainted. He asked for a doctor's help, but unfortunately, the doctor could not save her. While he stayed by her side, his wife apologized for leaving him and asked him to take care of their children. Park's team arrived at the fight, but Gelro thought it was too late now. The memory of Warden's wife passing away created a wide-range field, causing the sky to fall and making it difficult for the opponents to breathe and see. However, Warden was able to move with this emotional damage because he had to protect his children. He faced his opponents with his sword and asked Park about his eyes. Park mentioned that his ability was bothering him all the time. In Park's memory, he was about to depart from his home for military service and his mom was worried about him and crying. Park reassured her that he would come back in good health, but now that he was in another world, that was unlikely to happen. Park was furious that Warden brought up unnecessary memories for him. Warden was surprised to learn that Park had a family too, which angered Park and he punched Warden in the face but fell to the ground due to his weakness. Park was able to move despite being affected by Warden's emotional ability. Warden checked on the other two opponents and realized that his ability was still affecting them. Park revealed to Warden that he had already experienced this kind of emotion when he first fell into this world. Park urged Warden to continue the fight as he needed to stay alive for his parents. Warden questioned if Park was really a devil. Park tried to punch Warden again, but Warden countered with his sword, making Park dodge. Park then tried to kick Warden, but Warden grabbed his leg and threw him away. Warden continued his combo with a knee kick. Warden was able to knock him unconscious, apologizing that he had to do it to protect his family. Park's team arrived just in time to rescue him, and he woke up soon after. He was glad they came but urged them to leave the prison. Park was surprised to find out that his team was able to move around in Warden's field. Gelro explained that he used his ability to send some will and goal memories toward them, which was only temporary but enough to stop the field's effect. Gelro added that if they were able to move around in the field, it meant that Warden had become weakened. He further explained that in this field, no matter how much Park attacked Warden, he was able to recover. Gelro believed that Warden's power came from his warm memories of his wife, which took a lot of horsepower, and that Park was able to weaken him. Park ordered Gelro to use his ability to bring back Friday and Marley's senses. Warden managed to fling off Park's team and grabbed a Gary, throwing her away and hitting Manji at the same time. He then grabbed his weapon and pushed Park's team away. Park managed to throw his shovel at Warden. Warden stood up and kicked toward Park, continuing his combo by slashing his sword. However, he was interrupted by Bella's kick and Cindy followed up with a punch. Warden grabbed Cindy's fist and threw her to Bella. He then split his sword into two swords to fight, dealing with three people by himself. He managed to deal with all of them. Warden used his emotional ability again which made Park worry that he was still able to control the field. Then, Warden threw his sword toward Marley, causing Park to run toward her to protect her. Park managed to protect Marley, who had regained her senses but was crying that she could not save her children. Park understood her feelings and apologized for thinking only of himself. He told Marley that her children were still alive and that there was a chance to save them and encouraged her to bet everything on him. Marley smiled, but warned him that giving him more power would cause him to exceed his limits and lose his humanity. Park thought Marley was being foolish given that the world already considered him a devil and didn't care if he couldn't be human anymore. Nonetheless, Marley granted him her power, and Park transformed into a new form. Warden was surprised to see Park's new form and wondered if he had been reawakened. Park realized that all of his teammates had fallen due to the field's effect and decided to take on Warden in a 1-1 battle. Warden warned Park that he would gather all his energy, memories, and emotions into a single attack that would power up his sword. Park created a longer shovel from his mana and they began to charge at each other. Warden slashed at Park, but he was able to dodge the attack. Park countered by turning his body and slashing upward towards Warden causing him to lose one of his limbs. The warden's field disappeared, and he accepted his defeat and prepared for death. However, Park returned to his normal form and left him alive. He instructed Warden to leave the Empire with his daughters and never return. Warden's team also accepted their defeat after witnessing Warden's condition. As they left the prison, Gelro asked Park about their next plan, and Park revealed that his next objective was to kill the warrior. Parla Goddess, lost track of Marley's power 
and wondered what happened to Park. She snapped her fingers and saw what happened to the jail. She was surprised and glad that she finally created a masterpiece, hoping that Park and Kim would fight each other. The devil had completely escaped from the detention center, known as the Frontal Escape. It didn't just end in prison camps. The Empire was the greatest power in the world, and the camp was under the jurisdiction of the strongest man in the Empire, Hong. The fact that such a camp had been attacked meant that the Empire's national power was questioned by the whole world. The troops were carrying a coffin, and all the Empire members were mourning for someone. Han looked sad and reminisced about the old days he had with Kareem. The first day he met Kareem as a sea ranker and asked for advice from him. Han was able to surpass Kareem's rank, and Kareem was proud of Han and congratulated him. Han asked Kareem for love advice, and Kareem was happy to celebrate Han's success with his girlfriend. Kareem stayed by Han's side when he was having a hard time. Kareem was the only friend Han ever opened up to, and tears slowly started to come out of Han's eyes. After they mourned Kareem's death, Warden approached him. Han was glad that he was fine and that his limb had been attached back. Warden told him that he was going to retire, which surprised Han and he asked why. Warden explained that the Devil of the Oracle was actually a human who had a family and knew sadness and despair too. Warden thought that he couldn't fight him again in full power next time. Warden apologized to Hone and offered to take full responsibility for the Empire. Due to Kareem's death and father's retirement, the news spread quickly all over the Great Empire. Some people feared, while others were angry. Empire members had arguments about losing Kareem. The red-haired girl asked a man about June's whereabouts. And the man replied that he was with the devil. The red-haired girl's team started to visit them. Some creatures were inside a cage, and a big creature was tied up with steel chains. A man appeared and just relaxed on his couch. Some took the opportunity a girl with tattooed skin named Elise. Others mourned over Kareem's death, which is Karim's sister, Cram. Hone was determined in training his swordsmanship all over the world. It was quiet, but clearly a storm was approaching. At June's hideout, Park decided to open up his first business for military funds. He showed off his fried chicken to his team, and Friday was happy that he could enjoy the chicken. Gelro was glad that they were finally doing business. Park decided to share his story with his team while they were enjoying their fried chicken. He recounted everything that had happened to him, but surprisingly, no one seemed interested in his story. Instead, they focused on eating and enjoying the chicken. June already knew Park's story and urged him to eat more chicken. Friday was surprised at how good the fried chicken was, while Marley was disappointed that they weren't more amazed at her being a goddess. Park asked his team for their opinions on his story, but they didn't seem to care much about it. Although they believed him, they felt that something was off about Marley and Parlia's story. Friday remembered that Marley used to be an A-rank, but he couldn't talk more about it due to a contract that could kill him. Park discovered that the members of the Empire seemed to know about Marley's children, specifically Bape, but they refused to say anything else. Marley was happy to hear that Friday knew about Bape, but couldn't get any more information due to the contract. Suddenly, a purple muscle man and his pet entered their hideout and destroyed everything. Everyone prepared to fight, but the man introduced himself to Park as Mabomai, Upper Demon Race. Mabomai noticed that Park had mother's energy, but realized that Park was not one of them. He questioned Park about whether he had stolen his mother's power. Mabomai launched an attack on Park, but Marley interfered and stopped him. Mabomai was surprised that Marley, who he referred to as his mother, was protecting Park. Marley told Mabomai everything about Park's story and her journey with him. Mabomai apologized to Marley, expressing sadness for the loss of her power and ability to maintain her human form. He offered his pet to Marley, which she absorbed, regaining her power and returning to her original form. Mabomai was glad that Marley's divine power had returned and promised to protect her from then on. Taking her with him, Marley felt conflicted about the situation and looked to Park for guidance. However, Park felt annoyed by this and stopped Mabomai from taking her. Mabomai thanked Park for protecting Marley 
and promised to protect her himself from that point forward. Park grabbed his waist and told Mabamani to stop, angry at the situation. Mabamai understood their feelings and explained rationally that this was their world's problem and they should solve it themselves. Marley partially agreed with Mabomai, feeling conflicted as she realized that she was originally a god, but had fallen to a level similar to humans. She began to see humans as equals and was experiencing emotions that she never felt as a god, including feelings for Park. Mabame was moved by Marley's blushing moment and convinced to let her go with Park, teasing them about how precious they were to each other. However, he also made it clear that he would not allow Marley to suffer the pain of losing something precious and created a muscle to trap them inside. Mabomai explained that many of Marley's children pursued strength. Others wanted to be at the top, some just wanted to have fun, while others wanted to swallow the gods. Marley seemed proud of her creation, which annoyed Park as she had not told him about it. Mabome told Park's team that they were weak and would eventually die if they didn't prove themselves. He wouldn't let them leave the arena as long as there was a chance of death. Park was thrilled and wanted to fight Mabome to settle the matter quickly. However, Mabomai dashed towards Park and used his finger to touch Park's body, destroying almost half of his body. Mabome easily defeated Park. Much to the surprise of his team, they thought that Park was going to die. So Cindy and Bella rushed towards Mabome for revenge. However, Mabome easily stopped them and tied them up with his muscles. He told them to relax and assured them that Park wasn't going to die. Mabome explained that he didn't even have to use his hands to stop them. Loki implying that they were too weak to take him down. Mabame gave some advice to Park on how to use Marley's power and explain the dangerous situation he was in. Mabomai told Park that he was lucky Marley had given him her power, which was similar to Mabami. Mabomai could help him and teach him how to restore his destroyed body. Park used his power and slowly his body regenerated and recovered his lost limbs. Mabomai praised Park for his first successful use of the ability. Park went for another attack towards Mabame. But Mabomai easily destroyed Park's body again with his finger. Mabomai warned Park that he would randomly destroy his body until he got used to his ability. At the Imperial Central Church, the warriors were having a meeting with the Empire's members. The red-haired guy teased on for having a hard time and suggested that he give up the title of Empire's strongest army. The red-haired guy was a direct staff member of the doctor named Abramons, Abramons mentioned that there were already many suspicious movements in various countries. The Kingdom of Massivan had released criminal gangs and drugs into the Empire, which was now beyond anyone's control. Abramons provoked Hun by mentioning that Majesty had released Elise and Cram, Loki mocking that Majesty was disappointed in them. The warrior stepped up and told them not to worry about it. He was going to take care of it himself. Suddenly, an informant appeared in the meeting and shared information about the Devil of the Oracle. The informant explained Park's past and how he had slowly defeated the A-Rankers and built his team. The warrior was surprised that the Devil looked like a human being instead of a demon. He further questioned the Devil's background, which Hone explained was related to his fight with Park and Warden's fight. The warrior wanted to know the Devil's name, and the informant told him it was Park Byong Jang. This surprised the warrior and he started sweating. He turned his head to look at White to see what had really happened. White showed a seductive face towards him, implying that she already knew the devil was Park. The warrior became suspicious when he learned that the devil's name was Park Byong Jang and asked the informant to confirm it. The informant revealed that he used to be known as Champ Tiger, and the warrior realized that the devil was indeed Park. Hone and Abermans noticed something was wrong and questioned the warrior. He left the meeting briefly and took White with him to ask her if it was true. White confirmed that it was an ordeal from Parla Goddess and urged the warrior to kill Park again to atone for his sins and return to his normal life in his world where Park is still alive. Meanwhile, during Park's training, Mabame increased the intensity of his training to using two fingers. Marley objected to this painful training but Mabame insisted it was better than being exterminated later. This angered Marley, who told Mabome to stop. Marley expressed concern for his well-being, and Park asked about her feelings toward him. She acted sundere and told Park that she did not like him but saw him as a colleague 
However, Marley Loki hinted to Park that he was precious to her. Park accepted that Marley did not have feelings for him and found his purpose in seeking revenge against Parla. Marley is surprised by Park's response. He continued his training with Mabome and insisted that his team not stop him. Mabome easily destroyed Park's body again, but Park regenerated his arm and landed a perfect punch on Mabome's face. Meanwhile, the red-haired girl approached Jun's hideout but couldn't find it. One of her team members dug the dirt and discovered a purple muscle on the ground, revealing June's hideout. Suddenly, the purple muscle opened up and Park's team emerged, having passed their training. Park being a Chad, Park wondered who the red-haired girl was and thought she might be an enemy. Suddenly, Jun ran towards her and called her leader, which made Park feel relieved, and he fell unconscious. Mabomai realized that he went too far with his training. Mabome's ability was to freely control and shape his muscles, and he used this ability to create his clone to train Park's team. Regaining Cindy and Bella's muscles, Agari was able to go for an enemy's weak spot, and Manji's training was to hunt for food in the outdoors. Mabame dealt with Park and Friday himself, and they even had to eat and fight at the same time. Finally, Friday and Park landed a perfect attack on Mabome, ending the training. Gelro and June were cheering for their team throughout. They all moved to Manuel's hideout, where the blue-haired girl told June that he needed to be checked by a magician in case he was being tracked. June followed them outside, and the magician, Hey Jisa, found out that June's body had someone else's magic. Magician dispelled the magic from June's body, but suddenly, Jun fell unconscious and a body emerged from his body that appeared to be the doctor's. They tried to stop the doctor, but he was able to brainwash them in time. The doctor was happy he found Manuel's hideout, and Mabome left the hideout to lead his men. He assured Marley that they would meet again next time, and teased her that one day, Park would fall in love with her. Marley blushed about it and told him to leave, and Mabome left wishing them the best. Meanwhile, Han was ready to invade their hideout based on the doctor's report. Han and Doctor's plan was successful, as they allowed June to escape. Dirt Needle used his ability, Enhanced Eyesight, to locate Mabomai's position. Han drew his weapon and prepared for the fight. Mabomai felt strange that the Empire had found their location so quickly and realized that they had been tricked by June's energy. Understanding that Marley was in danger, he decided to fight Han, creating a long sword from his muscles and slashing the entire cliff. Han calmly stood on the remaining cliff to fight Mabamai. Meanwhile, the Manuel leader and Park introduced themselves and shared their goal toward Parla. The leader mentioned that Manuel denied the religion of Parla and that their organization aimed to create a free world and remove the oppression of this twisted faith. Park stated that his goal was to deal with the Empire first before dealing with Parla and wanted to start a business as well. She wanted to form an alliance with the Manuel leader since their goals were similar. Friday was surprised that the leader knew about Parla's faith's truth and questioned the leader's identity. The leader took off her mask and Friday recognized her as Lucy, a former first A rank knight and considered an S rank subjugation grade in the Empire. Returning to June, he woke up and made his way back to their hideout. The magician tried to follow, but June reminded him that he was not a member of Manwool and should not enter. The magician almost forgot about their differences since they had worked together for so long. As the magician left, he ran into the doctor and reported that he could no longer gather any information for him. During the meeting with Manwool, Gelro and Friday were surprised to see Lucy in attendance. Park inquired about her, and Gelro revealed that she had been in a relationship with Han before. Park was surprised to learn that she had been with such a serious guy. Lucy was impressed by Gelro's ability to gather information, but was embarrassed when she realized that everyone knew about their breakup except for her. Lucy donned her mask once again and continued to ask Park if he would join the Alliance. Just then, Jun burst into the meeting and informed Lucy that they had been tricked by the doctor. In the fight with Mabel May, he initially thought that Han's disciplined body was commendable, but he believed that An's inherent power was insignificant. Mabome thought that Juan couldn't beat him with his current level of strength. However, Hon revealed that he had never fought with his limits set and decided to push himself to his maximum. Hon's determination impressed Mabome, who then allowed him to go without any further conflict. Mabome then compressed his sword into his finger's tip and dashed towards Han. 
Touching Han's body, suddenly Mabome's arm was slashed off by him. Han continued his attack by slashing Mabomai again. Mabomai was able to create some distance between them and regenerate his body but he was surprised at how Own was able to cut off his arm without even taking any stance. Dirt Needle explained that Hone was born with a few abilities, and through continuous training, he had risen to the top of the Empire, making his combat and abilities far beyond human. Rizaska Hone was a monster of hard work. Mabomai mocked Han, saying that he tried to defeat him with his little ability. However, Mabomai was surprised to see two signs above Hone's head, and Han was equally surprised that Mabame could see them too. Mabomai explained that one of the signs disappeared the moment Hone cut his arm, but reappeared when he attacked with his sword. Mabame believed that his ability was to save an attack move and then release it again but he could only store up to two attacks at a time. Although Mabamai thought his ability was insignificant, he praised Han's attack as perfect and the result of countless hours of training. Mabome further mocked Han, claiming that he was born as a fake, while Mabomai was a true ruler and showed his first true form. They fought around the cliff and Hon managed to fight on par with Mabame. Hon released his ability to slash Mabomai's head, but Mabomai managed to dodge it. Mabomai landed his attack, but Hon blocked it, which sent him flying. Hon landed on his feet and ran away from Mabame, searching for a way to, to counter him. Mabome managed to close the distance with Hon, and Han parried his attack. Mabome then managed to push on down, causing him to fall on one knee while still parrying Mabome's attack. Hon released his ability to slash Mabome, but Mabome was able to slash his ability. Mabame continued his combo using his finger to aim for Han's head. However, Hon managed to dodge in time and create a distance between himself and Mabame. Han then recalled his past, where many people praised him for being a genius. However, he realized that the moment he was born, his mana was predetermined, and there was an unreachable stage no matter how hard he tried. Hon remembered always competing with someone and thought about the blonde-haired girl in his memory who resembled Lucy. Hon told Mabome that nothing could make him feel despair. Hon then used both stored abilities towards Mabome, unleashing dual release. Hon managed to slash Mabome, and he continued his combo by repeatedly slashing him. Mabomamai was impressed by Han's improvement and praised his hard work, which turned him into a genius. However, Mabome easily defeated Han afterward, mocking him by saying that he was born with talent and hard work, which Han could not compare to. Mabome punched Han, sending him flying and causing him to land on the cliff. Meanwhile, Lucy was riding a large flying species and found on nearby. Han recalled that Lucy was an apprentice who had already become an A rank with natural talent, which caught his attention. However, Han did not acknowledge her being a genius, while he was a C rank 28. In the Rosaska family, they were dedicated to God and the people. The biggest achievement in the family was Han's great-grandfather Rosaska Ega, who achieved the B rank. Han was the first in his family who could store two movements and was regarded as a genius. He attended the Imperial Night School with his family's expectations, but became a full-blown crook when he was 15 years old. He complained that natural talent was treated nicely, but mediocrity was not. Dirt Needle tried to comfort Hone and teased him that perhaps his whining was because of Lucy. Han denied it, and Dirt Needle advised him to try fighting Lucy. Han was surprised that he had not thought of that, but Dirt Needle was only teasing him and did not expect Han to agree to fight Lucy. Hone left the canteen and found Lucy reading a book. He approached her and asked for a fight, but was easily defeated within 10 seconds. Hone sent a letter to his family and told them that he would leave the knighthood school and train by himself. His mother was worried about Han traveling alone, but his father was glad that Han had grown up. Hone's mother used her ability on his father with a dual punch attack. Hone traveled around the world to find a new mentor to train his swordsmanship. He returned to school to fight Lucy again, but his schoolmates called him Ten Second Hong. He approached Lucy at the garden and asked for a fight which lasted 12 seconds. Hone underwent intense training just for two seconds, which caused quite some emotional damage to him. Lucy wanted to talk to Hone, but he ran away in embarrassment. Dirt Needle told Lucy not to worry, as Han would eventually come back to challenge her. Hone continued to challenge Lucy for four years straight, training and losing and training and losing. After all that training, his title changed from 10-second Han to 10-minute Hong. Slowly, 
his schoolmates' ridicule disappeared, and people started cheering for him. Lucy started to show more expressions. However, no matter how much Hun tried, he still lost and envied Lucy's talent. She became first in the A rank while he struggled with his vague talent. Lucy praised Han, saying he was more talented than anyone else, and admired him for his unbreakable fighting spirit. This made Han cry as she finally acknowledged him. The next day, Han went to Lucy's class and asked for a match. Dirt Needle was impressed with Han's new haircut, but Han was actually asking Lucy out for a date. All their classmates went crazy about it and cheered for them. At the cliff, a large group of bandits were gathered and eating. Hon and his team were watching from above and decided to take action against them. After successfully completing the mission, Hon returned to meet Lucy, and they hugged each other happily. Three years had passed since Hon graduated from night school, and he was awarded the achievement of being a ninth A rank at the ceremony. Lucy had also become the captain of the Imperial Knights, and the two of them got engaged. They walked happily together on the streets thinking about their upcoming marriage. Soon after, an operation to annihilate the bait began with all the rankers, including Han and special warriors, Elise and Cram, as well as ordinary soldiers, totaling 100 people, were deployed to subjugate 10,000 bait. Lucy, as the team leader, ordered the team to annihilate all the Bapes since they worshipped the evil goddess Marley. However, the Bape were much stronger than ordinary humans, and the war lasted for a year, resulting in the death of many a rankers. The thing that bothered on the most was when he saw a dying Bape carrying another dying Bape, asking goddess Parla and Marley why they were born. If they were to be abandoned, he started to question his beliefs and couldn't understand anything. They returned to the Empire and were recognized as heroes, but both Han and Lucy felt uneasy about it, wondering if they were just being used as pawns by Parlia, like fish in an aquarium. Han thought about Lucy's stress and how it had turned her hair red. Later, as Lucy was about to return to her room, she overheard a group of people having a meeting. She eavesdropped on their conversation and found out that the Bape were also Parlia's children. Lucy burst into the room and questioned her parents about why the Bape were considered heretical. However, her parents did not answer her, and she realized that she had become a murderer. They revealed to her the truth that even they didn't know that the Bape were Parla's children, and that it was an order from Majesty which is Parla's word. Her mother explained that Parla's religion was all about power, which had the strongest influence in the world. Parla wanted a new god and a new faith, which is why the Bape, followers of Marley, had to be killed. Lucy was devastated by the truth and slowly widened her eyes with despair. Lucy met with Hon and told him that she was going to destroy the Empire, which surprised him. Hon warned Lucy to behave or else her whole family would be doomed. Lucy revealed to Hon that she had also killed her own family. Han was taken aback by this revelation, but he had already realized that the Empire was corrupt to its core. After witnessing the war, Lucy mentioned the contract that stated that anyone who spoke about Bapes would have their heart stop and eventually die. She told Han that they needed to fix this together. Han understood that war was not a holy war and that he had no faith in either side. However, he could not leave with Lucy because he had family and friends who trusted him until the end, as well as a duty to the people of the Empire. Hon pointed out that the people of the Empire were unaware of the truth, and destroying the Empire would instill fear in them. Lucy responded that in a revolution, there was always a sacrifice. Han told Lucy that his faith in the Empire was gone, but his sword remained a tool to protect the people. She revealed that she had not shown her full strength when she fell in love with him and struck a powerful attack that sent him flying and crashing through multiple walls, eventually landing on one. Lucy then removed her engagement ring and threw it toward Han, bidding him farewell. Back in the present, Han is still alive and standing up with a different aura, dashing towards Mabome in a manner reminiscent of when he was able to slash Lucy's face in the past. Lucy launches another attack towards Han, but he remains unflinching and throws his sword towards her, surprising both Mabome and Lucy. Their bodies shake as they realize that Hone has become a different person. Hone realizes that his life is no longer just his own. He has to protect his friends. Mabome and Lucy's instincts tell them to take him down immediately, but they want to see what kind of madness he has achieved. Suddenly, Han disappears from the ground and launches towards Mabome and Lucy. While dashing, Han remembers his past failure to stop Lucy 
and is now ready to launch his final attack towards Mabame. Marley notices that Mabame's energy is strange and hopes that nothing has happened to him. Marley wonders what Park is thinking. Actually, Park is worried about his next battle due to his past battles with Kareem. Friday, the Doctor, Hone, and Warden. He has never won in a clean sweep, so he wonders if he really needs to join hands with Manuel in the future. Marley wonders if this is the right opportunity to seduce Park while thinking about Mabome's advice. Marley is determined to do it and slowly moves toward Park's ear. She tells him that she can shoot 100 bullets. Park is overjoyed and keeps laughing about how he has 100 shots, which disgusts Marley and makes her lose interest in him. Park's confidence returns, and he decides not to join hands with Manwool and leaves the large flying species. Lucy jumps off as well, trying to stop them. Park orders Marley to transform into a gun, so he can give a warning shot toward Lucy. Park shoots the bullet, which surprises all of them with its immense power. Park is happy that he has a new great power. Lucy stops chasing them and is also glad that Park is strong enough to change the world. While they are in midair, Park tells his team his plan that they need to start a business first and find the right location. Gelro mentions that the Kingdom of Mashin is a perfect location for them to open their business. Park is happy and decides to sell fried chicken to the Kingdom of Mashin. In the Kingdom of Mashin, the bearded man is selling illicit drugs to two adventurers. The bearded man requests 50 more price, which angers both adventurers and they decide to kill the bearded man. Suddenly, the bearded man orders Snow King to settle them. He reads a poem that was so cringe, inducing that it freezes both of them. The bearded man requests double the price while touching their shoulders. Park's team arrived in the Kingdom of Mashin and discovered that the citizens were actually escaped convicts. Jeldo suggested that they needed an initial fund for their business. Park had a better idea and looked at Gelro, indicating that he may have some hidden wealth. Gelro and Friday went to retrieve the initial funds. Meanwhile, Park went with Agari and her man to find a business location and was approached by a stranger who gave him an object to smell. Park found the smell unpleasant and told the stranger to back off but suddenly found himself in a hallucination and wanted to smell the object again. Agari managed to stop him and explained that the object was a drug called Kalina that made people addicted to it. Gelro thought that their addictive chicken and delivery service could monopolize information as the business spread, allowing them to conquer the country. However, they soon discovered that a large organization had already taken over the country, led by the bearded man. One day, the bearded man and his gang tried the fried chicken and were so impressed that they called it drug chicken and decided to swallow the business as well. They thought the people who did business in Mashin were stupid. A crowd was queuing in front of a restaurant when some men tried to push their way in to conquer the business. Friday appeared and instead of fighting, they decided to try the fried chicken. Marley served them and her beauty attracted their attention. The gang informed the bearded man that Friday and Park, the devil of the oracle, were the owners of the business. The bearded man thought the group was foolish for trying to build their nest in Mashin. Suddenly, a giant man entered the restaurant and destroyed it. Friday was angered that his sacred chicken was ruined and decided to fight the giant. The giant provoked Friday, telling him that the rank system only applied in the empire, not in Mashin. He punched Friday in the stomach, but Friday retaliated with an uppercut that sent him flying into the sky. Park appeared and grabbed the giant man, demanding that he pay for the damages and get acquainted with their organization. He then smashed the giant into the ground. Park ordered his team to work part-time jobs and destroy the organization trying to stop their business. The bearded man was glad that the devil of the oracle was there and hoped to put him under his control, making his heart flutter. The battle was sure to be legendary, 